This is Jerry Bain at the Coalition for Networked Information Spring 2023 meeting, and I'm here with Martin Halbert, National Science Foundation Program Director for Public Access at the U.S. National Science Foundation. Welcome. Delighted to be here, Jerry. So I'll just get into the questions here. There's been a lot of talk and speculation surrounding the 2022 Office of Science and Technology Policy Memorandum on new public access requirements for federally funded research. This is also often referred to as the Nelson Memo. Um, would it be possible for you to briefly summarize the crux of the memo and some key issues resulting from the memo that folks in technology and higher education should be aware of? Certainly, Jerry. Um, so this memorandum issued by the White House OSTP was actually the second such memorandum in a number of years. The first one came out in 2013 under uh, then director of OSTP, John P. Holdren. Mm -hmm. uh, the gist of these two memoranda are around the, uh, the sentiment that publicly funded research should be publicly accessible is the, the core of it. The uh, particular stipulations that the Nelson Memorandum came out with were that, uh, well, it's a very dense memorandum, first of all. I would encourage everybody to take a look at it if you're interested in the specifics of it. But kind of the most salient points of it that got the most attention are the facts that uh, it was requiring federal agencies to put processes and policies in place such that research, specific research outputs, mm -hmm. specifically in the form of uh, juried, peer-reviewed publications and the data that it was um, used as evidence in conjunction with these publications be made immediately accessible upon publication, mm -hmm. uh, freely and, and uh, you know, easily accessible to the public. Uh, that is something that I think many uh, groups in higher ed uh, should be aware of, and agencies will be implementing those requirements over the next few years. In particular, this is going to have uh, uh, ramifications for repositories of various kinds, both repositories that store publications and repositories that store data. So is it retroactive? It is not retroactive. It is uh, going forward from okay, this gotcha. point. And in fact, it, it does not take effect until 2025. So agencies have a couple of years to implement these um, requirements. What many people may have heard about is that agencies are developing their planning process right now. And we uh, are, and, and major agencies submitted our planning process documents to the White House uh, at the end of February, just, just recently, and we will be making those uh, plans to plan publicly available pretty soon, and we'll have more discussions. We're very interested in hearing from the various stakeholders and the research community about this memorandum, their thoughts on it, their perspectives, as we start moving towards uh, implementing the requirements of the memorandum. So what are the pain points here for libraries and researchers? A lot of different groups have a lot of perspective on this um, and what their respective pain points are. Libraries, uh, in particular, are, are very positive on this memorandum. Uh, for example, the uh, Ivy Plus uh, group of libraries issued a statement in support of the memorandum and all of its different stipulations. So they are very uh, eager to see agencies implement these practices mm -hmm. and, and policies. Uh, there is concern in the publishing community and some scientific societies that moving to a quote-unquote, zero embargo situation upon publication, it, it may have effects on their uh, overall you know, business models mm -hmm. and so forth. And then there are lots of perspectives from individual research communities who are fretting about the burden of reporting requirements and the associated uh, dissemination of their findings and their results. So it's a complex situation right now, and uh, both agencies and the different research communities that they serve are in a dialogue, especially this year, 2023, which is, uh, a, has been designated the Year of Open Science as a, uh, a discussion, a series of discussions and engagements between the different um, members of the research uh, community. In light of that discussion, is there anything in particular that you feel has been commonly misconstrued about the memo um, yes. that you could help clarify? Yes, indeed. Um, many times uh, we get approached 
uh, in the agencies with concerns that this memorandum is somehow going to obligate people to uh, release and disseminate uh, data that, that cannot be released with personally identifiable information, for example, or national security secrets, or any of a whole variety of restricted data types. It doesn't say that. It only says that in the case of data that can be released in this way, that there aren't any of these sorts of sensible, logical, long-standing restrictions to public access, that that data, if and, and only then if it is in, in use, um, you know, in, in a supporting capacity for particular claims in articles mm -hmm. that are peer-reviewed, only that data is what is being uh, required for public access. That makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned the year of open science. What are some of the possible implications of this effort for higher ed? The advent of the Nelson Memorandum and just the general interest and uh, a lot of different individual developments in the field this year led a number of different uh, federal agencies, more than a dozen at this point, major agencies, to really decide to come together and try to synergize and align our efforts in 2023 on uh, and around open science uh, and methods and uh, activities that can broaden the participation in sharing scientific results, uh, synergistic activities that agencies are funding. Uh, and I can give you some examples at NASA, the TOPS initiative, Transition to Open Science, at NSF, the Pharos RCN solicitations, with complicated acronym, but that represents uh, advancing fair data guiding principles, open science, in the form of what NSF calls research coordination networks, mm -hmm. RCNs. And, um, you know, we just thought that many agencies saw it as an opportunity for uh, coordinating on catalytic efforts to advance open science more broadly in the, in the nation and the, and the country and the, uh, as a whole. Well, it's an exciting time, it sounds like. And it is. In, the, in light of that, what's your view on the evolving focus on research integrity as part of OSTP's work, and, and how are you relating it to open science? It's such a good question. Um, research integrity uh, unpacks into so many great different themes, reproducibility of results, discoverability of results. Research integrity is a broad topic that NSF and other federal agencies that fund research are very committed to and very interested in, in seeing advanced and ve just very interested in uh, this focus by OSTP, very supportive of it. And um, we see it as very uh, integrally linked to open science and the dissemination of research results. Can you uh, compare or contrast that view that you have with um, what our friends in the UK and the EU are doing um, and elsewhere? Uh, wh while I can't speak for those uh, right, of overseas agencies, right. um, I think that this uh, general, the broad issues of open science uh, have gotten a lot of attention, especially in Europe among our, our, our colleagues over there. Uh, and I do think that there are things that we can uh, learn from our colleagues in Europe on these topics. We are listening very carefully, not only to uh, research stakeholders in the United States, but the uh, positions and observations of our colleagues in overseas research funding groups and so forth. Mm -hmm. So on a personal and professional level, you had a career primarily in research libraries yes. before this, uh, before moving to the NSF. Can you talk about that transition and your experiences with that? Absolutely. And I, indeed, I was a, uh, a dean of academic libraries at, at several different institutions for 15 years. I found that, uh, well, first of all, I love the NSF culture. It is a incredible place to work. It is, you know, the, the greatest minds in the, the country coming together to foster research ac across all the different areas of science and technology that NSF serves. I have been delighted to be a part of NSF. I found that all of my uh, career experiences in uh, research libraries have been very relevant, actually, uh, to uh, working with different uh, groups of scientists and scientific endeavors through the agency. Uh, I do encourage other librarians to consider getting involved in federal agencies and publicly funded 
research efforts. I think librarians have a lot of insights, especially around the organization and dissemination of knowledge that are very relevant to the, uh, the kinds of work that uh, and the, just the uh, publicly funded uh, awards that different uh, federal agencies that are grant making make every year. That's great. It's interesting work. And I'd like to ask, is there anything about the Nelson memo or uh, otherwise uh, things going on at the NSF that we haven't covered? Uh, just that NSF is committed to the broad range of open science activities and synergistic efforts that uh, are, are great you know, opportunities for coordinating in the in the context of the Nelson Memorandum. We celebrate this particular uh, accomplishment, this memorandum, by Dr. Alondra Nelson and her staff and Dr. Prabhakar, the new director of OSTP. Uh, and we really see this as a, a, a wonderful new day and a new opportunity for advancing open science concerns nationally. Great. Thanks so much for your time. You bet. Thank you.